My name is Damon. And this is my daughter, Velvet. <laughs> Are you trying to plant Dad? <laughs> She's just turned four. So the film is a letter to my now six-year-old daughter showing her what the world could look like in 2040 if we put into practice the best solutions that are already available. So I call it an exercise in fact-based dreaming. Everything I show her in the future has to already exist right now and has to be scalable and practical in some form. And the reason I made the film, or the reason I made the film, it was just feeling like an overwhelmed parent, like I think a lot of us are, and not really knowing how I was going to explain the complexity of our current situation to her and thought that what I don't have in my artillery is the potential of what we could do or any solutions that exist. I think we've only been bombarded with that dystopian negative narrative. And one of the first people I spoke to in my research was an environmental psychologist named Renee Lertzman in America. And she said that when we are only hearing that information that comes with a charge of fear and dread and anxiety, it actually activates a part of our brain called the limbic system. And when that's activated, it shuts down the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is where we problem solve and we think creatively. So when we're only hearing that one side of the story, there's a lot of paralysis for, for some people. So I sort of thought, well, if we're going to sound the fire alarm, you've also got to show people where the exits are. And I think that part of the narrative, that solutions narrative, really needs to be ramped up. It's not to say or steer away from the urgency of the predicament we're in. That's absolutely understood and real. But I think as a way to motivate people and bring them out of that place of fear and paralysis, um, we need to start throwing up people and things and stories that we can tell that inspire them into action. So in the film you concentrate on like four or five mm. solutions I would say, some pretty specific, some more general like mm. autonomous cars. How many more did you come mm. across or are those the only ones that you think are viable? It's a good question. So th I think the we researched for about eight months before we even filmed, and the first cut of the film was three and a half hours. So, Good stuff. yeah, I mean, it's like only 90 nice minutes now. That's right. Very dry <laughs> and boring and very <laughs> academic. But it speaks to the testament of how many great things are actually out there. But ultimately, what it came down to were finding solutions that had multiple cascading benefits. So, they weren't just silver bullets. And I thought, even for those people that might be dubious on climate change, which in my country is quite a few people, we'd want to do these solutions anyway. Let's restore and regenerate our soils. Let's help the ocean. Let's empower girls and women. Let's decentralise our energy. Let's embrace more ride share and, and sharing economy solutions. So basically that's, they, that was the remit, that what were the cascading benefits? Did they, did they benefit other things other than just sequestering carbon from the atmosphere? Industrial ag says, oh, without us, you're, not, you're gonna starve, you're not gonna eat. Well, actually between 70 and 80% of the food in the world is created by smallholders. Industrial ag provides 20% of the food in the world. Most of that is corn and soy fed to animals. A lot of that is sugar, which we don't need. So the idea that big ag is gonna save us or without which we cannot exist is absolutely upside down and backwards because they produce sickness, they produce obesity, produce diabetes. And that's what big ag is producing. Just imagine what we could do with the one-third of the world's cropland that is currently being used to grow food for animals. This land could transition to a range of regenerative practices that draw down vast amounts of carbon into the soil while retaining precious water and producing nutrient-dense food. Instead of soy or grains, we could feed the animals grass, crop residue, or food waste. This would improve the health of the animals, the people who choose to eat them, and our environment. We've looked at hydroponics. We've looked at growing mm. food in shipping containers. Mm. Um, so they're very local, so they're very fresh, and they don't have to be transported as far. And I wonder what you thought mm. about that. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would say that any type of urban agriculture is essential right now. And I think there are great examples like the Victory Gardens back historically that we've done this before. 
um, the benefits for emissions, but also I think just the, the importance of reconnecting to nature. I think that's our, one of the biggest problems we can discuss here is that people have so become so separated from where their food comes from or even putting their hands in the soil. So I love, it's why I put that in the film, that idea of actually replacing some of those parked cars and, and parking stations with reintegrating nature again. Because we know that, they, that there are studies now that say that the health benefits rise significantly when you're around nature or you're immersed in nature. So I think that's one of the most important things we can do is allocate space in our cities, whether it's food, whether it's just simply a garden, whether it's animals, whatever it is, I think that's uh, going to be a big part of moving forward if we're going to get through this. And you think we can reclaim that space by reducing the number of cars we own because they are autonomous and, and we don't own them, we kind of share them? Yeah, so the experts that we spoke to said that in the same way that we have Netflix and Spotify now, which has alleviated people having individual ownership of CDs and DVDs, if we started subscribing to transport networks, instead of owning your own car and paying insurance, registration, um, charging it, it would be far cheaper to subscribe to an autonomous vehicle because the driver cost will be gone as well, which will drop the price even further than what it is now. But if enough of us embrace ride sharing, we could reclaim our cities for humans instead of vehicles and generate millions of new jobs. The extra space in our cities could allow the building of more low-cost, sustainable homes. And we could see the growth of remanufacturing industries, which might convert existing vehicles to electric. But most exciting could be the urban food farms that spring up in empty parking lots, or inside disused car parks. Now, this is obviously up for discussion about whether we can do that. Will companies buy that space in advance and do something else with it? But that's why I put it in the film. So let's at least entertain this possibility. So if it does come up for that discussion, people are armed with what it would look like with the nature there instead of more buildings and feel more compelled to fight for that and act for that. Because again, this is why the visioning and the imagination I think is crucial right now. We've got to give people things they can fight for, not just fight against. And we've got to show people what it might look like on the other side of this crisis as a way to motivate them into action and taking responsibility. But I think probably the most exciting solution in the film is seaweed. Seaweed is good for food, animal feed, fertilizer, fiber and biofuel. There's so much we can do with seaweeds. <laughs> Marine permaculture is a regenerative technology that works like this. A frame made of recycled material becomes a platform for the seaweed to grow on. It sits just below the surface and sinks lower as the seaweed grows and gets heavier. The seaweed can be regularly harvested and used for a range of purposes. I mean, it's the fastest growing organism in the world. It can grow half a metre a day and up to 50 metres long. So what that means is it's just turbocharged sequestering that carbon out of the sky faster than a tree. And the scientists we've spoken to have said that once you cut that seaweed off, once it sinks below a thousand metres, the weight of the water can store it as carbon on the ocean floor. So we're actually next year having the first global seaweed symposium to bring together ocean experts, engineers, impact investors to say, how do we scale this up really quickly? Uh, do you dump all that harvested seaweed in one stinking pile in the middle of the ocean somewhere, the Mariana Trench, or do you drift it around? And, and like, what, what are the ramifications there? Uh, and I'm really proud to say that through the film, we, we set up an action campaign off the back of the film, where, which allows people to help bring the solutions to life. And we raised, just through $10, $15 donations, um, $600,000 to build the first seaweed platform in Tasmania. So we start that next year to test the engineering. To see. This charming 23-year-old is Neil Tamane, who has studied alternative energy technologies and come home to help power his country. Turns out I wasn't the only one who wanted to hear him talk. So what we do is we interconnect solar home systems and we enable energy sharing between them, which is basically trading, and the customer chooses when they want to trade and when they don't. Instead of building large grids, we're proposing a decentralized structure where we start building grids bottom up. 
The setup is quite simple. Any home that has solar panels and a battery can buy this special box, which connects them to another house with the same setup. The box allows the buying or selling of energy between the homes. But it gets better. There is still a segment of the population that still can't afford to buy a solar home system. So instead of doing that, if they can just buy a small soul box, they can just buy energy when they need it. You fill up your soul box with money. As you keep using energy, it deducts money. What this means is that all the boxes can connect to each other to form a microgrid. It's like a water tank of community energy that people can give to or take from. The beauty is that this microgrid can then connect to the adjacent village's microgrid and the network becomes stronger and stronger. You have one solo home system, you interconnect with your neighbours, you make it 50. Slowly you interconnect villages. Once you've collected 100 villages, you can hook it up to the grid. You can sell to the grid. Forget buying from it. You become the primary energy generation source for the country. What I think is the most controversial or, dare I say, the most unlikely solution from the film to catch on mm -hmm. is the idea of decentralised solar <laughs> panels. Because for me, that's the bit where great big corporations yep. have a stranglehold on our energy yep. and would be very threatened if we started talking about, we don't need you, we're going to generate our own energy and buy and sell it from each other. Yep. Of all of the solutions, do you, do you see what I mean? That that's, that's, that's the least likely that we're going to be allowed to do as well, non-huge corporations? Well, I can tell you that it is illegal in your country and my country and America, and for precisely that reason. They're protecting that hierarchical structure that the companies want to own all that money and, and energy. But what is happening in my country is there are some really interesting test cases being done by a version of our government that's sort of testing renewable energies. And so a couple of new housing developments have got this technology and it's working. And 2,000 residents in Canberra, in our capital city, were allowed to do it. And the results have been stunning in terms of their costs, um, slashing emissions. But the first version of it will be that you'll be able to share your energy as long as you're with a particular company. So within that network, you might be able to do something similar and they'll take a clip of it. But I think it might take 10, 15 years even more to get to a point where we're actually completely peer-to-peer -peer selling it across different networks. Also, in more developed countries, we've got so much infrastructure, the poles and wires are already there that companies want to recoup on, mm. so that is a barrier. But I think what's exciting is even since we filmed it in Bangladesh, which is three years ago now, how quickly that spread through Bangladesh, Africa, uh, India as well. So as an alternative for developing countries, instead of them building coal, nuclear, whatever it is, this as an alternative model I think is really exciting. And I do think, speaking to a lot of the experts, that we will get to a point where we are decentralising it. You know, it might be further on than 2040, but it is going to happen. Yeah. I've been wondering for a while whether the real reason that climate change is such an issue is, is not because of the technologies that we've been inventing, but it's the number of people that we have on the planet now. And I wonder whether even the terrible pollution we had in the early 1900s would have been okay mm. if the population had stayed at that level. Mm. And it's something that you talk about in the film, isn't it? The, the, possibly the biggest problem is the exploding population. Yeah, so the, the research we discovered in the film was that there's about 100 million girls that don't get to complete their education every year for a variety of reasons, religious or taken out to put to work. And if a girl is able to complete her education and is given access to reproductive health services plus viable work opportunities, she gets to choose when and how many children she has. And that comes down to two. But if she is taken out of school early, the number is five or more. So the UN says that by 2050, that's a difference of 1.1 billion people, which has an enormous impact on our resources. So empowering girls and women, fantastic. Let's do that anyway. But we get this other bonus with our emissions and resources. I think that the, the danger of just saying it's population, because it's definitely a factor, but I would also say it's our lifestyles and the amount of consumption that we have, the amount of cars, televisions, some people own devices. So we can't entirely lay the blame. And I would argue too that we're getting to a point where the metric of GDP and happiness aren't 
necessarily correlate. Yeah. So there are you know, countries in Europe that have half the GDP of America, yet their well-being metrics far surpass America. Or well, Costa Rica has, I think, a fifth of America, but their longevity, well-being, all sorts of other metrics are way higher than America. So I think that story is starting to come to an end. So would we actually be better off in some way by not consuming as much as we do? It's the minimalist movement. It's when not only are we leaving a footprint, but we're clearing space for other things in our life. Do we need to work five days a week? All these questions I think are important to start asking because we've just been blindly following this belief that GDP equals happiness and GDP and growth equals prosperity and I, and I just I think people are starting to question that. Yeah. The problem I always come down to when I want to make a change myself is this. I'm just about earning enough money yeah. to keep my family mm -hmm. happy. Yeah. I look around me None of the bigger corporations are giving me easy options to change my lifestyle that I can afford. My number one priority has to be my family, so yep. I'll put off making the change until yep. tomorrow. I think most people face that, and that's yep. the system seems to be geared against us making individual changes. Uh, without a doubt, and that's happened over the last 20, 30 years, especially this sort of story, which I think you could call it hyper-capitalism of the last 20 years, has created this problem. And I think that a lot of people, especially in my country, young kids that just can't afford a house or don't even think they're ever going to own a house. So they are fighting for their own survival just to get by. And then when they're asked to think about the bigger picture and global issues and climate change, they just don't have the capacity. All parents are trying to get their kids to school and don't have the time. And it's just cheaper to do the bad thing. Yeah, yeah. And, th and that's, that's right. what they have to concentrate that's on right. is, is you know, saving money. We haven't made it easy. But there, again, there are great examples around the world of of government just making simple choices that incentivise people to do the right thing. And there's really strong examples of that. Um, some of the Northern European countries have taken all sort of taxes off electric cars, for example. They get free toll road use, free parking in the cities. In my country, we put a luxury tax on electric vehicles. So it's just not incentivising anyone to do the right thing. There's another fantastic example of smart policy which has happened in Japan where they realised they were running quite low on their metals and so they put a slightly higher price on all of electrical goods and it's actually legal to throw away, so whether it's a device or a washing machine, and they then collect the goods instead of throwing them away. They've created a remanufacturing industry, created mm -hmm. lots of jobs, and they reuse the materials. They now recycle 98% of their metals. You know, and that's just a very simple mechanism that can make a fundamental difference to a society. And I think, again, what often gets left out is that 70% of our emissions are coming from the wealthiest 20%. So as important as it is for people that are trying to survive and struggle to sort of make a change, we need really large shifts from people that are flying regularly around the world, uh, eating huge amounts of meat that's factory farmed. Like they are someone, the people to be targeting, and I think that's by their own admission. Uh, Extinction Rebellion and other groups like that, I think, are learning that, that there are certain groups of the community that we should leave alone. And in fact, we want to bring them on side they're not the ones causing the damage. Like, I'd be, be more specific with who we're targeting. We saw the yellow vest was the same thing. You can't just put a carbon price on everyone. Why don't we actually scale it at least so the people that are using the most fossil fuels are getting hit the most? It seems to me that there are too many vested interests in mm. keeping us doing things the way we do. There are yep. too many people making too much money. And I do look around and, and think it's an insurmountable yeah. challenge. Mm. Is it? I thought that four years ago. I must admit that. I, I, and I still have moments, of course, where I think, gee whiz, we're not going to get through this. But I don't think there's any value in that feeling because that does shut you down. And what's the point? You know? So I, I search for solutions. I search for the people that are trying to make change. And that's what gets me up in the morning and, and thinking about my two daughters. But to the very crux of that question, I think we have to acknowledge that we have created a rivalrous and competitive system that is pushing certain people and even types of people to the top of that system that don't necessarily have the interests of everyone in mind. And that's a deep flaw of what we've created. And I think uh, there's a, a great guy who you might know called Daniel Schmachtenberger who talks a lot about this. And he says that what we've done is modelled it on, an, on a Darwinian evolutionary model. We've created these markets where you know, the best product survives. And all. But what we don't discuss is that in nature, within that comp competition there's also it's it's framed in a symbiotic framework so the shark hunts the fish but if the shark evolves to be greater in number or strength than the fish it would eat all the fish and then itself would die 
What we've done, and we've forgotten to factor in, is that our own evolution comes with technology. So we've now been able to apply the hunting skills of the shark, but build super trawlers that can, can hunt hundreds mm. of tons of mm. fish in one catch. And we're not confined to one part of the ocean. We can move to different parts of the ocean, which other animals like the shark can't do. So what that's done is we've completely knocked ourselves out of any kind of balance with our natural system. Wasn't that always, and wouldn't that always happen in the evolution of an intelligent species that harnesses technology? Wouldn't that always happen? Because where would you draw the line? Where would you say, no, that's, that's too much, let's, let's row back from that? Well, this is the great challenge because I think we, as a species, we have a terrible track record of surviving as a civilization. Every civilization, Mesopotamians, Sumerians, Romans, have all suffered a similar fate. And here we are standing at that fork in the road again. And I think if we, I think we all, intrinsically understand that if we keep doing what we're doing, we know where that's going to end. So the deeper question is how do we shift from that competitive rivalrous system we've created to one that's more symbiotic and interconnected? And that's probably our greatest challenge and was another motivation for finding the solutions in the film. If you think about each solution we look at, whether it's regenerative agriculture, uh, even rideshare cars, they're sort of based on very different principles. It's not a competitive arrangement, it's actually working with nature again. You're pulling that carbon back into the soil, you get all these benefits around food quality and water retention. So it's a less sort of fighting nature as opposed to working with that inherent structure of it. So that is a much deeper discussion, but I, I think we're not gonna get through this unless we somehow pivot to that and have a deeper metaphor for how we treat our planet. The film is full of practical examples mm. of things that we can do mm. as long as governments and the big corporations, I guess, are on our side. Mm. Do you or have you come across any practical examples of how to get governments mm. and really big corporations on our side when it's really against their interests in the short term? Again, that comes down to a systemic design flaw. That's the challenge, um, that we are so addicted to growth and our economy is built on that growth model, so we're going to have to keep expanding. So that's a great challenge. You know? But I think there are interesting examples of even heading to some kind of middle point. Before we kind of work out and design collectively what we might want the next system to look like, which might be 50, 100 years away, mm. there are what I think are quite encouraging signs around... So we've spoken to quite a few corporations. We showed the film at the Climate Action Summit in, New York, in the UN in New York. And the head of Maersk, who's one of the biggest shipping companies, huge carbon footprint, stood up and said that we actually can't get people out of the universities to work for us at the moment because they're saying, why would I work for a company that's destroying my future? So they have pledged to go zero emissions based on the pressure that is coming from underneath. And then a few other people put their hands up and said, we're all finding that. So, that's to trust that whatever is happening at the moment, this state of flux that we're in, is having an impact at that high level. No one knows what that's gonna look like or the outcome of that. But I think as you know, once we start getting technologies like blockchains that can, we can scan our food and track not only the distribution points, but also the quality of the soil, the nutrient density of that soil, that's gonna hold companies a lot more accountable to be transparent in their supply chains and other factors. So I sort of have a glimmers of hope when I think that, that will be much more empowering for us as a population. And I also think that historically, great change has never happened through governments. It's, we've taught leaders how to lead on certain topics. If you, and I think a great analogy for climate change, although slightly smaller, is what happened with the abolitionists, that everyone who was fighting against slaves, well, was um, wanting slaves to, to, to go, were told they were utopian, that the economy could never survive without slaves. If we give up our slaves, another country will have an economic advantage. It's exactly the same language that the fossil fuel industry are using. And yet through various non-linear events, a groundswell caused it and then the tipping point happened. So if we are gonna create some kind of change, I think that we, we would all feel that something's going on. Whether we're close to a tipping point, I don't know, but I certainly don't think whatever happens is gonna be linear. I think that's, that's almost a guarantee, history says that, that no one will expect it and something might tip and it might be a catastrophe. We don't know, um, no one knows, but I think um, why I made the film is to at least have an intervention on what I think is an expected nihilistic narrative. Most Hollywood films you watch, there's no nature. We're all humans being chased by robots living in slums. And that's in our subconscious, that's just a, a, an image that we hold and our children hold about what the future might be. So. I thought it was really important to kind of throw up a slightly alternative narrative to that and say, hey, that's, maybe we don't need to go down that path. We can bring nature into our cities. We can have more sharing and stronger communities. And uh, whether that's 
going to come to fruition or not, I don't know. But I just couldn't accept that that alternative future was what my daughter was going to march into. Yes, John, the ice sheet is now melting faster than the scientists predicted. We're seeing large waterfalls pouring off the side of the ice. It's an alarming acceleration. The need to address this is so urgent that it often overwhelms me. The science says the more CO2 you put into the atmosphere, the higher temperature gets. Mm -hmm. Politicians and big corporations still, at the very best, see doubt, yep. and at the very worst, say, no, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. How does that make you feel? Uh, it's a particularly pertinent question for me as an Australian because we have a government that completely denies climate change, and we have some of the worst fires we've ever had in my family. Um, and friends were evacuated from my town. So I feel a, a deep sadness and anger at that, uh, and a lot of Australians do at the moment. And the problem in Australia is we've, we're completely crippled because our government is so embedded with the coal industry. That's how we make our money, we export coal to China. So they are so controlled by, all their advisors are on those mining boards, and so they are just holding tight on this narrative. And we also have the problem that we have Rupert Murdoch who owns 70% of our media in Australia. So we're losing it we are losing a narrative war because that paper, which so many people read, is saying that this is all nonsense, that Greta's the leader of a climate cult. You know, this is the narrative that most Australians are getting. So it's not their fault, they're just being completely misled. And that you know, leads us, I guess, to a, an even more interesting conversation about how polluted our information environment is. You know, it's one thing ecologically how polluted we are, but I think there's no doubt that a pathway forward to clearing this mess up is to actually work out a clearer way of making sense. What are our established truths? Because if we don't do that, we don't have democracy. And that's where we're in right now. We're in this flux of information. No one knows who to trust, who's authoritative anymore. It's, it's just this drifting state and it's a bit of a mess. And I think climate change is a great example of that. You know? And uh, we get centred on a daily basis and people are really convinced that there's other scientists that don't think it's happening and while the country's on fire. So it's, um, it's no easy task to unravel. If people want to do one thing, what would you advise the first step oh. to be? See, I, I sort of have a problem with that question because I think that there is no prescriptive answer for that. And I think we've fallen into that trap of saying, eat less meat, ride your bike to work. But if that doesn't resonate with you, then where's your entry point to connect? So what we did was um, create a sort of a platform off the back of the film where we ask you to activate your own plan. And we teamed up with 50 different organisations around the world. We ask you some questions about the type of person you are, what you resonated with in the film, how much time you have, are you willing to volunteer or contribute financially? And then we give you six or seven things that resonate with you personally. And then all these different ways and entry points to get involved. And it's just been extraordinary to see the follow through of that. So I think it's the number one thing I'd say is probably to find your own entry point, what you're you're passionate about what your agency is at your work, at school, wherever it is. But also I think we need to talk about it a lot more. I think that's been a big barrier is let's actually start having really heartfelt conversations about where we're at and admit that and in all its pain and ugliness, but also what kind of world we do want to create. And I think if we don't do that, we're just going to march into someone else's future that's been constructed probably as we speak. So I think we, we really need to have those important conversations and that was a big motivation for making the film. Listen, thanks so much for your time. Pleasure. Thanks for having me.